Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, what happens if you find yourself with a big inheritance? Well, after you split it with your good friend, Doug, you'll want to listen to today's show because we welcome to talk about inheritance strategies from Goldstein on Gelt, Doug Goldstein. Plus, in our headline segment, one author reviews some funds that got hit hard in 2008. If the market drops again, are you in these categories? We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline to Danny, who wonders about dividend-paying stocks, read a listener letter from Loretta, and wash it all down with my incredible trivia. And now, two guys who are still waiting for an inheritance. So they're here working. Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-J. I don't want to be the guy who's waiting for an inheritance. Will somebody die so I can get some money? I I don't want to be that dude. Have you ever thought about the number? Do you have your number, Joe? Like if you found it on a suitcase on the side of the road or somebody called and said, your third great uncle left you all the money. Have you ever thought about what your number is to, you know, maybe not ever turn the recorder on again? There is no number. Not being here with you? In in the basement? Are you kidding me? Okay. I love Good. you, man. That's what that that's what I was gonna say too. I wanted to make sure that we were on the same page. <laughs> Welcome to Wednesday on the Stacky Benjamin Show, everybody. I'm Joe Salci, I average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table, just so you know who's who. The sultry voice of, of yours truly. Oh gee. Yes. The other guy. You know what's funny? We have so many people that don't know the history of that. We do that now, don't we? It's yeah. ridiculous. You know, yeah. almost everybody I talk to. They just kind of go with it, but don't know the origins of it. One day, maybe we'll have to talk about the origins maybe of it. At some, at some point, we might talk about that. But not now, because right now, we got a great show. We got Doug Goldstein uh, in the basement. We've been talking inheritances. And actually, this whole idea of sudden money. You know, people get weird, OG, when they, when they all of a sudden <laughs> yeah, get really weird when they've got money they didn't have before. And uh, so we've got Doug here waiting in the wings and also people, you know, making sure that the money goes to the right people or the right charities or groups that you want Mm -hmm. to have your money. We're going to talk about all that stuff on today's show. Death on today's show. Going to be great. Mm, Awesome. (laughs) Can't wait. Sign me up. But first, you want to say 450 bucks? Of course you do. The average person who goes to Magnify Money saves $450 when they head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money whether it's for better checking accounts, better savings accounts, paying less interest to the man, lots and lots of fun at Magnify Money, plus an award-winning blog over there, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for all the financial products you use every day. And we're also brought to you by Slack. Slack is the communication hub that we use here in the basement. It makes sure that the right people on our team are always connected and in the loop and key information is always at our fingertips. It's exactly the same for you. Learn more at slack.com. That's slack.com. Love using Slack. All right. Big day here in the basement. Doug Goldstein waiting upstairs with mom. But before him, we got some headlines. So let's get this thing rolling. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from CNBC. This is written by Darla Mercado. These 401k funds took a beating in 2008, and it could happen again. Imagine being two years away from retirement. Clickbait. (laughs) Do you have these things that might go down 50%? Click here and check our advertisers. I mean, read our article to find out. Well, guess who clicked it? I did. And I'm talking about- Save us all a click. I'm talking about it on the show. saved you click. You're welcome. Which- you may have thought was shielded from massive market corrections. You thought your 401k was, by the way, getting back to the piece. And then you have it tanked by more than 20%. That was the reality in 2008 for workers who'd invested their savings in 
target date funds. These funds are intended to invest your savings in a diversified portfolio of underlying stocks and bond funds. As your retirement date approaches, your target date fund would gradually reduce the equity allocation and increase the bond portion or to lower market risk. The kick off the Great Recession, including a 777 point decline in the Dow Jones Industrial Average on September 29th, 2008. Ah, glory days. <laughs> Remember so, those? Oh, that was great. My liver remembers that day. <laughs> disabused target date investors of the notion they were safe from market swings. Quote, the year 2008 was a period that put target date funds to a test, said Jeff Holt, director of multi-asset and alternative strategies at Morningstar. Those that were approaching the retirement date were immune to significant losses in the market. Here's what went wrong and how it affected your retirement plan even 10 years later. Uh, the next header says, when everything fell... <laughs> Target date funds with retirement dates beyond 2020 experienced losses exceeding 30%, reflecting the fact that those funds were heavily allocated towards stocks. However, those investors still had years to continue saving, and they were able to ride the bull market that started in March 2009. The situation was more grim for investors in near-dated funds, including those set to retire in 2010. So imagine you're retiring in 2010. It's 2008. You're like, okay, going to put all my money in this target date fund. Among those funds that were hit hard included the Oppenheimer Transition 2010, which experienced, wait for it, a 41% loss in 2008. About 70% of this fund's assets were invested in equities, according to Morningstar. The financial crisis also unearthed another risk. Bonds weren't necessarily a safe place to hide either. Quote, some funds were burned because they were too aggressive on the fixed income side, said Holt. But still, I'm still with you, OG. I don't really want to riff on target date funds here. I want to riff more on if you're retiring today, you don't need all your money today. Why don't you have it allocated so that you've got money that you need in two years in this super safe place? And maybe you thought that a target date 2010 fund is safe, but if you know how a target date fund works, like you can't cherry pick which part of the target date fund you can take money out of. So a target date fund two years from retirement, I don't think it's an optimal place. I have a big problem with the whole synopsis of this article, which is you got screwed because you had a target date fund and the market went down. It did exactly what you would expect. To, how would you have done any differently if you pieced apart this fund and allocated it in big and small companies and international and U.S.? You would still experience this thing. And in the article, the author is, I think, saying, "Oh, if you had, the, if, if you didn't have these, you might have been okay," which is also bullcrap. That's the insinuation. That's kind of how I hear it. Well, it is the insinuation because everything went down. But I think that if you pull away from that, I totally agree with yeah. that. But if you pull get away with that this. and get a little more analytical, even if you had the pieces, OG, and everything went down, you still wouldn't have had those pieces, only those pieces, if you were retiring two years from now, would you? Well, here's how we think about it. So I really believe that equities for the long run, and especially now, there was a great article that I think uh, Josh Brown tweeted out. He went to um, like a town hall meeting with Jamie Dimon. From Chase? Josh so Brown. About yeah, Josh Brown is from Reform Broker. So you can Reform follow Broker, him on Reform yeah, Broker. Yeah, and uh, Jamie Dimon, CEO of Chase, JP CEO Morgan of, Chase. Uh, Chase. So I don't know. He did a town hall. Anyway, uh, Jamie Dimon had some pretty interesting things to say about fixed income, but but uh, which I, I should have copied because, you know, I don't want to say I said it first, but maybe he listens to me and then forms his opinions based on what he listens to the show from. But so I really strongly feel in this kind of long-term equity portfolio is the right place for most people. But you got to take your own individual risk tolerance and tolerance for volatility into account. And so how do you juxtapose that against, but I'm going to retire in two years and <laughs> I've got this real risk, which is this unknown bad timing, just bad, just pure bad luck. I mean, you could think about the folks that came into your office, Joe, and the folks that came into my office in October 2007 and said, oh, gee, Joe, what do you think? Market's at an all-time high. I think I'm going to retire January 1st. And we all said... Sounds great, Bill. And the best thing for Bill would have been to literally go into a coma until <laughs> until May of 2009. Because, you know, he was down 30 or 40 or whatever odd percent by March of 2009. I get that. So how do you how do you get around that risk? Well, first of all, you have to understand where that threshold is for you. Is it 
10 is pretty weak, to be honest with you, but 20, 25, something like that. And I think you have to have a distribution plan that looks just like your investment plan. So you dollar cost average in, you should dollar cost average out until you hit your threshold. And you negotiate that with your advisor or on your own and say it's 20. Then you start pulling from cash. Because you think about the timeline of this. If you had two years of cash and you said, my threshold's 20%, so I have a million dollar portfolio. When it gets down to 800,000, warning bells go off. We're going to stop taking it out of your your investment portfolio. We're going to stop dollar cost averaging out. Switch to cash for the next two years. Well, where would that have put you? In this example probably would have activated this cash somewhere in the November, December timeframe of 2008. And so now your portfolio with $800,000 in it has all the way until December of 2010 to just recover. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to sell anything. And you've got this extra cash bucket for two years of distribution just sitting there. The safety and security of having that extra money is worth not having it be invested and having some opportunity costs there. I think uh, if you have more money than you need for retirement, building up that cash buffer, so you're buying time. You're buying three years or four years. Absolutely. There's no genius to two. Yeah. You could do three or you could do five or whatever whatever you want to have. No, but I'm saying if you're close, well, then maybe it has to be two and you just have to kind of roll the dice a little. But if it's if you have more than enough, then use that instead of investing it, make your buffer bigger so that you can yeah. can protect your portfolio. That, that's a problem I have with people that don't like cash, by the way. I feel like there's investors out there that want to optimize the entire portfolio every single dollar. But yeah. that cash is suboptimal when you look at it by itself, sure. But when you look at the fact that it's this freedom from worry and I can keep my stocks more aggressive because I have it, now yep. my stocks are performing optimally because I have that cash. If I don't have that cash, I got to kind of hedge the stock portfolio. Well, you just look at it from a behavior standpoint and everybody talks a big game. You and I have experienced it and we see real life experiences. You can't tell me that when you have $200,000 and it goes down by 30%, you're going to feel the same way as if you have 2 million and it goes down by 30%. Yeah, the real number there. Six, it's just an, 600 thousand. Oh, no, I'll stay the course. I'll be fine. Yeah, I had 2 million last February, but now I'm down to 1.4. No problems. I feel I feel comfortable. Bull honky you do. You're scared, you're angry, you're nervous. All of those things. And just now think about that if in addition to that you had another $160,000 just sitting in cash, just doing his thing, minding his own business, getting his little 2%. Now, how do you feel about going, okay, I can, I can wait that out. You know, I can cut my expenses a little bit. Instead of living on 80 grand, I'll live on 70. I've got 200,000. You know, it just gives you that, br- that breath of fresh air. And the only time you feel that is when things aren't going good. All the rest of the time you're going, yeah, this is dumb. I should have, I should get this money. Invested. I got 200 grand in cash. This is dumb. I should have it invested. And you got to resist that urge. We talked about on Monday. Everybody wants to do step seven, eight, nine, and ten because those are the real cool ones. But you got to build the foundation the right way. Building cash is not the cool one. But the cool thing is, you get seventy five thousand in your cash account. You can get those cool chase rewards. Hella good, hella good chase points. Jamie Dimon then is high five in you. Yes, he is. (laughs) You get to go to his town halls. He's he's better off than you are. Well, I'm very proud of us, OG, because we just better off than me. You're right. I'm very proud of us because of the fact that we just we just did a uh, target date fund piece and uh, really didn't rip target date. Also, funds. they suck. <laughs> yes, we got to get that in there. So for these who, those of you playing the home game, they still suck. So uh, yeah, good stuff. In our second headline, you know we're getting this bad rap. OG, we are totally getting this bad rap. People saying that they don't learn anything here, and frankly, I'm sick of it. I, I don't know about you, but I think I've had enough start. of that. We're going to try to learn them something. You, we are going to try to learn something. We are fixing to learn y'all something. So we are wheeling out the people who can actually teach things. And our friend, Jen Hemphill, who's a way better teacher than we are, Jen is going to help teach one of our friends and she can help you too. So Jen, take it away. 
Hola, welcome to Spanish Made Easy with me, your host, Jen Hemphill from the new Su Dinero Importa podcast. Today, I'm joined by the co-host of the Choose FI podcast, Jonathan Mendonza, and together we will share a popular and simple Spanish phrase so that you too can use it in your own life. Sound easy? Absolutely. Today's popular phrase is crucial whenever you are first introduced to a woman named Brittany at a fiesta. What you do is you walk up to her and say this phrase. Hey there, Brittany. Do you pay your credit card bill in full every month? In Spanish, you'll say this popular phrase just like this. Hola, Brittany. ¿Tú pagas la totalidad de tu tarjeta de crédito cada mes? Once again. Hola, Brittany. ¿Tú pagas la totalidad de tu tarjeta de crédito cada mes? Now let's hear the co-host of the Choose FI podcast, Jonathan Mendonza, try it. Ready, Jonathan? Okay, here it goes. Hola, Brittany. ¿Tú pagas la totalidad de tu tarjeta de crédito cada mes? Nailed it. Uy, qué bien. That was perfect. See how we sound nearly exactly alike? You two can speak Spanish easily and comfortably just by listening to Stacking Benjamins and my new show, Su Dinero Importa Podcast. See you next time. Ciao! See? See, OG? They sound almost exactly alike. We can learn you something. Amazing. Well, not we, but on our show... The yes. show in general learns you. By the way, congratulations to Jen. She's so cool, isn't she? If you're a Spanish-speaking listener and you want a good Spanish-language podcast about money, Su Dinero Importa is the name of the show, and I'm sure I slaughtered the hell out of that. It sounds just like it. <laughs> it's just like her, because I've been yeah. studying uh, Spanish made easy with Jen Hempel too, here on the show. But anyway, Su Dinero Importa, uh, you'll find that coming up. Uh, the end of this week. So congratulations on two fronts to Jen Hemphill. And by the way, thanks to Jonathan from Choose FI because uh, he, he nailed it. And I think that's lesson number one. Listen to us for Spanish Made Easy. And then lesson number two is retiring in two years. Maybe you shouldn't just have all your money in a target date fund, even if it seems like it's for the appropriate time frame. It's still, I don't think, is analytical enough. Well, this guy we know very well here in the basement because he's my co-host at the Money Tree podcast. He also has a great show called Goldstein on Gelt, and he's coming down to the basement to talk about inheritances and we're going to talk about estate planning, an important area, OG, that people don't like to talk about. Nobody likes to talk about estate planning. Who wants to talk about their own demise? I'll tell they you what, though. do it. If anybody can make it entertaining, Doug Goldstein can. And to prove it, here he comes down to the basement. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our good friend, Doug Goldstein. What are you doing here, man? Oh, I almost tripped on the last step there, buddy. Jeez. Oh, I could sue, couldn't I? Then I get a lump sum of money. There needs to be something to sue for. I don't know if you've seen <laughs> this place, but you got to be able to get something, Doug. That's the key. When you sue, make sure you go after the big money. Oh, I hear you. I, I like that chair you're sitting on. <laughs> there, there, there. He sues me for the for the chair. Well, I don't know, the banana chair that you've got. But anyway, hey, let's talk about, speaking of big money, let's say that you're somebody that got sudden money. You work with these people all the time right? People that either receive an inheritance or maybe, you know, I don't know if you've ever worked with a lottery winner, but you see people screw this up all the time, Doug. You get sudden money. What's the first thing you shouldn't do? Well, that is the perfect question. I will just, before I answer, of course, I got to give you the aside. I once had a client and I, I made the joke because we all do. Well, you know, if you, if you won the lottery and she goes, yeah, I did. And I'm like, well, where's the money? Because, you know, she had a few hundred thousand with me. She goes, oh, we blew it all. And I was thinking, you're exactly the story that they teach us in stockbroker school. When most people win the lottery, they go, they go bankrupt within two years. And this was pretty much what happened to her. So 
my one bit of anecdotal evidence is actually people totally do mess up. They, they get a lump sum of money. I've certainly seen it happen with people getting an inheritance. And frequently it happens right at the beginning. Like you were asking, what what's something people do as a big mistake? They think that like now they got all this money and everything is going to be different. And the fact is, in most cases, you're not getting that much money and not everything is going to be different. And if you act like it is, you're going to wipe yourself out real quick. Well, because the numbers, Doug, the, the numbers don't work out, I think, as sexy as we want them to be, right? Like a million dollars sounds like a ton of money. But if you're trying to live on that, that's not nearly the cash cow you think it is. Yeah, I, I think. Well, I'll give you an example, a story that actually happened uh, a few years ago. I met with this guy. Uh, I would say he was a client, but he wasn't. And he got a $200,000 inheritance, which seemed like a lot of money. Right? That's a nice sum of money for a lot of people. And so I gave the whole song and dance about long-term investing and compound interest and stocks and bonds, and mutual funds, that kind of thing. You know, I felt like I was just staring at a fish because he was just not even blinking. And he, he never called me back to open the account. And a little while later, I, I ran into him. I said, well, what's your plan? You know, you didn't think I was brilliant? He goes, well, Doug, no, you are brilliant. But I've decided I'm going to invest in my own business. So uh, we can talk about the pros and cons of investing in your own business. And I'm like a big believer in entrepreneurship. But I believe if like the type of investing in your own business would be buying a factory or something with hardware, right? What did he invest in? He was a life coach. And he was investing in a couple of courses for himself and he took this $200,000 and, and claimed he was investing in himself. But what does that really mean? It means he was sitting at home and blogging and bothering his wife and spending down $200,000 over the course of about eight or nine months because, you know, that's <laughs> once you have the money, why not spend it and pretend you're investing in your own business? And that was not investing in your own business. That was just being lazy, calling yourself a life coach and, you know, at the end of the day, you have a, maybe you have a website. Yeah, I could think, I mean, if you're a life coach or a restaurateur or whatever, if it's part of a business plan and maybe it goes into the marketing of your business and you've already play tested the marketing and you know what I mean? If it's part of a well thought out plan, it's one thing. If it's just, hey, I'm going to invest in myself and start up this new business, it gets a little scary. Yeah, but I think the problem is people fool themselves. There are some businesses where I, I get like you invest some money. I don't agree with things like being a blogger or a podcaster or a life coach or even a financial advisor. These are not things where you, you should start at the outset when you don't even have anything. You get an influx of cash and you say, okay, I'm going to invest. Uh, the, the way to build a business like that is from the ground up because there's a lot of education that entrepreneurs get. That's part of being an entrepreneur. You have to love learning. You have to love trying and experimenting and failing, right? You, you got to fail a whole bunch of times. And if you don't do that, if you don't go to the school of experience, you'll, you'll never succeed. And I, I'm sure, Joe, you have seen this many times. And I, I'm just like running through my mind of clients who I know who inherited huge sums of money and they, as it were, invested in their own business. It wasn't an investment. It was just right. paying their own salary and they were just blowing the money. No, now I get exactly what you're talking about. If it's a, if you already kind of know what the ROI is because it's a business that's up and running and you're just going to fuel that ROI, then that's one thing. But this idea that I'm going to start off as a financial advisor, that was a great analogy. I get that one. <laughs> or a life coach or whatever it might be. That's a whole different thing. I had clients that when they were working with me, they knew a ton about cattle. And they had worked in the cattle industry for a long time. And we actually put together, only time in my career we put together a portfolio where cattle were the centerpiece of their portfolio. But it was because we had an existing operation. We knew exactly what the influx of cash was supposed to do. They already knew and could quantify the downside risk on that money. Much of the same stuff that we could do in a portfolio, clearly more aggressive, way more aggressive than what we would do with the diversified collection of stocks. But to your point- Well, they didn't feel that. They didn't feel that owning cattle was aggressive, right? Because they knew that business. Oh, they actually did. They were surprised when I kept asking them more and more questions, but they could continually produce data. And I finally <laughs> actually, I finally actually went to them and said, why wouldn't we invest in this? Well, and they said, you're the only financial guy who's ever said that. I'm like, yeah, but look at, you have all the data you need. You know, the downside risk. We already know that in your portfolio, you have enough to make it without this money. Why, why would, it's what you love. It's what you know. I wouldn't overemphasize this. I think it'd be crazy, but why wouldn't we kind of lead with that? Why wouldn't that be well, the lead part of our hand? You know, it's, <laughs> it's funny. I, I went, uh, 
I don't know. If, if, I don't know if you need the whole preamble to the story, but my wife and I went away for a few days to some fancy hotel and, uh, you know, great breakfasts. And of course, you go to these your huge breakfasts and then you have to go to the gym. And I got on the walking machine that's synchronized with my Apple Watch. So I'm having a great time, big, cool TV. And I watched some nature channel thing about cattle. And the interesting thing apart about this is I was inspired about investing. And I'll tell you why, because it turns out that, you know, cattle is a multi gazillion dollar industry. This yeah. is not a small industry. Economies that begin to improve. One of the first things that they start spending money on is meat. And we see that in China and we're seeing that in Russia. So this documentary was about the cattle industry in Russia because the cow people in Russia were importing beef from South America, and they realized it was super expensive. If only they could have their own heads of cattle. So I'm trying to use like real lingo here. So they they hired these like real life cowboys, you know, guys with names like Chip and Todd, <laughs> you know, from Texas, is and that, they flew over to Russia. Is that what the cowboy names are, Chip and Todd? I don't know. Like, you know, I, I'm a middle aged financial guy. <laughs> You know, from New York, who now lives in Israel. So I, I, I really couldn't come at it. But anyway, they were like building this whole industry. And um, the derivative of this, I think, is that the cost of beef today is so high compared to what we're going to see in the future, in the near future, with things like synthetic beef and they call it clean beef. All of these things are grown in laboratories, which are much better for the environment. And apparently they're much safer and they're going to be much cheaper. Anyway, I'm just saying yeah. that uh, if you know an industry and you really know it, that's one thing to invest your money. Another yeah. thing just to blow your money because you have a lot of it. Yeah, because I'm going to become a life coach and I'm going to invest in myself and who knows what that means. You Let should me. buy a cow, Joe. <laughs> you should. Sell some milk because you live in Texas. <laughs> I, I should, what am I thinking? Right. I'm in podcasting in Texas, not in cattle. What am I thinking? L let's talk about how to set it up though. So I received this inheritance, Doug. And I have this money, whether it's $200,000, $20, $2 million, where do I start? So I'm going to go for the, the very first things to do is there may be a couple of bills you have to pay, like funeral expenses, or there might be some debts that the, the deceased incurred or that even you might have. So I, I always tell people that in any financial plan, it's always going to work out no matter you know how big and fancy a plan we make for someone. So it's always going to work out that if, if you have bad debt, let's wipe that out. Let's get rid of your credit card debt or your pay loan debt or if you have a bad car loan or you know, super expensive debt that's really weighing you down, pay it off because otherwise you're just paying interest. I don't mean a mortgage. I just mean bad debt. So go ahead and do that. And also, if there's anything in the portfolio, which is crazy, like options that are expiring or stocks that are much too risky for you to even consider having at any point. A lot of times you'll see the, you know, the husband really loved trading stocks. So he owned like two stocks in his million dollar portfolio and his wife, who's going to have to go into a nursing home pretty soon, inherits it. That's someone who should sell those stocks right away because she can't stand the risk. Those are things that are kind of an emergency. Got to take care of it right away. But once you've dealt with the emergency stuff, then just chill out, sit down, Go watch a documentary about cattle in Russia and cowboys named Todd and Chip. Wait a month, two months, six months, right? Listen to a couple of podcasts, Stacking Benjamins, Goldstein on Gelt, Money Tree Podcast. Educate yourself, but do nothing. Stay away from friends and family members who have all these brilliant ideas for you. There's always going to be some other brilliant idea next month, so you don't have to act too quickly. And then build a financial plan, which is, you know, the, the financial plan is the blueprint for your for, for the whole big picture. And that takes a little time, work with a, with a financial planner, a CFP, someone who cares about you and can spend the time doing that. This is the part that people miss though. I think they think yeah. I got to get this money invested right away, which, oh, wow. I, which I love your point is you don't have to. I, I think of, as you're talking, Doug, I think about Warren Buffett saying there's no such thing as a called strike in investing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I told that to Warren, you should have seen like his <laughs> eyes lit up. He was like, what? I, that's brilliant. He and said, I'm like, going to use that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. And now today I'm <laughs> quoting him and it, it makes you angry, doesn't it? It does because he's got gazillions of dollars and <laughs> I'm here talking to you, which I would do if I had gazillions of dollars. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. You'd be first. I'd be first on your list, I'm sure. But back to your point. So then I build the financial plan and what's that going to give me? The key takeaway of a financial plan is going to be in terms of investing, what the asset allocation model should be, meaning, you know, what percent of your money should be at risk? 
things like stocks, what percent of it should be safe, things like bonds. It's going to be the big picture. Financial plans don't tell you what you should do day to day. They just give you the, the sense of where you are today and where you're going. And they paint the yellow brick road for you to follow in order to make sure you you ultimately arrive at your destination, which for most people is paying the bills every month till they die. That's the bottom line. And that's what the plan is going to show you. It seems like, Doug, as you're talking, I think about when I put money in my 401k or I put my, my money into my investments, I look at a timeline. I'm standing here today and I look at my goals and I say, okay, I've got this goal 10 years from now. I want to make sure that's funded. Or I've got the first five years of retirement. I want to make sure that's funded. And then after I get the first five years of retirement funded, then I got the next five years and then the five years after that. So I'm working from today out with this sudden money it seems like I might want to work the other way. Have you ever thought about that? Where does this money fit? Do I use it to fill further ahead from today, make sure the kid's college is funded, make sure retirement's funded, that my cash reserve is taken care of? Or do I say, you know what, this money is lockbox money. And by lockbox money, I don't mean social security lockbox because that's <laughs> broken, but it's end of life money working forward. So, okay, th this will make sure that later in my life, I always have this nest egg. Which way do you look at sudden money? Yeah, I want to argue against your first way of looking at it, because it's not that you're wrong to sort of segment money in that way. And I know a lot of people like that. They like the whole bucket concept and you have different buckets of money. And I get it. And I, frankly, I've even said it to people and I see it as a way of thinking about it. But as a financial advisor, I have to tell you, I don't really look at it that way. I look at this kind of continuum of where you are. What's your trajectory? So when people say to me, well, Doug, you know, what's the no amount of money I need to have in order to retire? Again, I don't look at it that way either. One of the, the main tools that a lot of financial advisors use, so I'm not going not gonna to claim I'm the one who invented it, uh, is the Monte Carlo simulation, which is a way of looking at someone's long-term financials by saying, not just I expect to make, you know, 5% a year for the next 20 years and will I be able to make it? But a Monte Carlo simulation will literally check thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of possible futures and then determine the odds of success. And by success, again, the core success is having enough money to pay the bills every month till you die. And then along the line, there may be other expenses, kids' education, vacations, you know, buying one of those uh, tall balloons that they have in front of car <laughs> manufacturers that shakes around a lot. If that's your goal. You got to have one of those. So that's how I would look at it. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you that that I don't really agree with your premise in the question. But therefore, if someone gets an inheritance, I just plug that into the Monte Carlo simulation and say, OK, the client had six hundred thousand dollars. Now he just got a million dollars. So he's got one point six million dollars. What can we adjust? Can we lower the risk in his portfolio? Could we increase yeah, yeah. his spending? Yeah. Could we increase the amount he gives as an inheritance one day? Just different ways of looking at it. Yeah. If it becomes clear you can make it, then we can lower the risk. I, I, I got you. It opens up a whole different, different avenue. Let's talk about the other side of this. Instead of receiving an inheritance, let's talk about giving inheritances. Because there are things that people do that cause friction when they're trying to get money to their heirs. We just saw all the news about Aretha Franklin recently. Um, and it looks like if the reports of an $80 million estate are out there, she might be looking at $35 million in estate taxes people are talking about. That's quite a lot of friction, Doug. How do we, <laughs> how do we make sure we pass that money on efficiently to the people, the charities, the avenues we want to have have it? So first of all, let me just, let me just start right away on the charity thing, because that's, that is the best way to give away huge sums of money and avoid the taxation on it. But I also think it's something that you have to do during your lifetime, and you have to do it in a way that you're going to teach your kids about the importance of charity. I have said this many times, but I think it's just worth repeating that the richest people I know are the people who are the biggest donors, not only in terms of money, but in terms of percentages. And I always ask them about it. We talk a lot about charity because that's part of the overall financial plan. And they always tell me that, you know, Doug, when things are, are not looking so good, I up the amount of charity I'm, I'm giving, and then it just things begin to improve. And so you can talk about, you know, religion or God or yin and yang or just whatever. But I think you could also attribute that to an ability to separate your emotions from the money, which is what ultra wealthy people can do. When you give away money, that means you don't see it as yours, right? You see yourself as a conduit to distribute the money to whatever choice or whatever charity you like or whoever you want, which is a great thing. I mean, who wouldn't want to be giving away millions of dollars? 
but by doing that, all of a sudden, it's not all about about you. It's not so how rich can I be and how you know how what can I have a bigger yacht or a bigger car and can I just keep trying to have more and more stuff to impress all the people around me. These wealthy people that I know, they don't do that, and therefore they're able to make much smarter decisions about investing in money because they're not so emotionally tied to it. I've seen that myself in my life, and actually there have been studies that have shown. Uh, study after study that shows that people that give more. And frankly, if you're somebody listening to this that doesn't doesn't feel like you have money to give, just start off with giving time because giving time is important. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to to my question because I'm running out of time, which is <laughs> you're trying to give money to a charity. You're trying to give money to your kids, to whatever. Let's talk a little bit about the transfer vehicles that make that happen correctly. How do mm -hmm. we start off making sure the money goes to the right people? Number one is make sure you write a will. A will is a relatively simple document. Keep it simple. Absolutely do not try to do something complicated because the more complicated it is, the more it's open for argument, the more it's open to interpretation, and the more it gets messed up. I was once speaking to a lawyer who told me that she had seen a will where the lady had said she wanted to donate money to this charity and that charity, and she listed also about 12 different beggars that she used to give in the street, you know, the sort of the standard people who would always be there. And she kind of described the old man who sits on the corner of that street and that street. And when the, the, the will was probated, someone had to go prove that they had donated money to all these people. It was like a nightmare. So make a will that's very simple. If your situation is a little more complicated, like a second marriage or uh, kids who may or may not be getting equal amounts, or if there's someone going to be left out or a spouse is going to be left out, that would be the time you want to begin to consider a trust because a trust is often going to be a document which exists during your lifetime, which is one way of proving this is what you really meant with your money. In other words, if you put your money in a trust and you live off your own trust for a few years, it's going to be very difficult for someone to come along after you die and say, well, you know, Joe didn't really mean that. You know, it must have been he must have been under duress when he signed that will, because the argument back is, are you kidding? This is how he lived his life for the past 10 years. And so obviously this is what he meant. So it, it makes it much, much harder to argue against the intentions of the, the grantor, the person who wrote the will. And although it's a little bit more complicated to, uh, to put them together in the beginning, it really works. And just make sure the lawyer you talk to who's able to write it up for you actually has a little bit of experience in writing trusts. Yeah, the, the, the one-size-fits-all lawyer is not where you want to go. And I also prefer the lawyer, Doug. I don't know. I didn't ask you about your take on this, but I prefer having a lawyer help you set it up instead of one of these uh, off-the-shelf services only because – your family's going to go back to a lawyer later on if you pass away, or well, it's not if, is it? When you pass away, I suppose, if is wishful thinking. But, or if they kill you to get the inheritance right. sooner. Which is, uh, but they're going to the service a lot of lawyers provide, but it's, you know, they're going to, the, yeah, they're going to go to somebody. And if you've already found an attorney who you know, who you trust for this stuff, then your family doesn't have to, while they're emotional, go find somebody later. So I, I tend to yeah, like doing that ahead of time. That's a benefit, but don't forget, you don't have to use the same lawyer that you know your your father used yeah. 45 years ago to write the will. Good Any, point. Anyone can probate the will also. Yeah, good stuff. I could ask you a few things about what's going on with you. By the way, thanks for stopping by. You have a book out on this very topic, but even for a more niche audience, which is your specific audience on inheritances. Yeah, I would say you cannot get more niche than than what I do. <laughs> you know, I'm, a, I'm what's called a cross-border investment advisor. I work with people who live outside the United States who have U.S. investment accounts. There's all sorts of uh, complications and rules and regulations you need to know about it. And even more specifically, most of the people I work with are living in Israel. So they're Americans who live in Israel, but they have U.S. investment accounts. So I wrote a book specifically for them called, you know, as I'm saying it, I feel like this is ridiculous, but I, there are, you know, there's tens of thousands of people sure. in that position. But the book is called The Inheritance Book, What You Need to Know About Receiving and Investing in Inheritance from the United States When You Live in Israel. It's awesome. And where can we get it? Check it out on Amazon. You can check it out also on goldsteinongelt.com, which is where I podcast, or on my corporate website for people who are living outside the United States but want or, or have U.S. investment accounts. My corporate website is profile-financial.com. Well, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, what's going on at profile-financial, because people that listen to you and I together every week at, at Money Tree know about that site. But at profile financial You've got some cool short videos that you're making to help people understand their money better. 
Yeah, a lot of times people get overwhelmed with a book or even a, a show that's an hour long. They, they want to just get one idea. So I made these, what I call these four minute money videos. And also there's a four minute money audio podcast. Nice and short, cut to the chase. I teach one thing uh, a lot of the time, about 30% of the time, it's about special for cross-border investors, but I guess I leave 70% of the time. <laughs> it's for anyone who wants to learn about good old-fashioned investing, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, financial planning, how you're going to get from where you are today to the, the riches that you envision for yourself in the future. And if you're walking the dog or on your morning commute, I'll link to that in the show notes at stackybedjamins.com. By the way, you said people that get lost in an hour show or get overwhelmed I'm very proud of the fact. I don't think we've ever had one complaint of somebody that said they got overwhelmed listening to Stacking Benjamins. That was <laughs> well, you know why actually. I'll tell you because uh, the difference between your show and a lot of other shows is your show is actually interesting throughout, and you've got different sections. Yeah, nice. A lot of people they just drone on and on about that, the same. You know, that's what things. I was. That's what I was asking for. Just. Keep it coming. Oh. Keep the praise coming. I love you, Joe Salci. <laughs> I love stacking Benjamins. Send me a t-shirt. <laughs> That's right. We, we got to get you one of those. Absolutely. <laughs> Doug Goldstein, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Man, that Doug Goldstein guy is fantastic, isn't he? I mean, right? It's nice having someone else in the basement that knows a thing or two about money for a change. I'll bet that's because his name is Doug. <laughs> While I'll admit Doug G is the master of inheritances, I'm still the king of trivia, so let's prove it. What is the median inheritance size people leave behind? I'll be back with your answer right after this. Thanks to Slack for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Slack is a collaboration hub for work, whatever work you might do, whether it's a podcast, working with several different groups of people, freelancing on your own, Slack's got you covered. With Slack, the right people in your team are kept in the loop and the information they need is always at your fingertips. Teamwork on Slack happens in channels, letting you organize conversations and information around projects, offices, and teams. And because... Everything you need to work is in one place. It's faster and easier to get things done. With Slack, your team is better connected. Find out more at slack.com. Slack lets you organize your team with real-time messaging, video or voice calls, group file sharing, and searchable archives all in one easy-to-use app. You don't have to search anymore through emails for that one follow-up or search through multiple systems to figure out what the heck you're looking for. No more switching across all these tabs and platforms to keep updated. Of course, it works with a lot of the apps you already use like Jira, Salesforce, Zendesk, and Google Drive. You can tailor it with more than a thousand different apps. We use, as an example, Appear In for off-the-cuff back and forth video chats because we're located all over the country. Everybody, believe it or not, isn't in the basement. And because of that, we use Slack to bring the basement everywhere. Plus, there's mobile apps for iOS and Android. I used those the whole time that I was in Europe. Did I tell you I've been to Europe? Uh, that sync seamlessly, and you can always pick up where you left off no matter where you're at. Slack, where work happens. Learn more at slack.com. That's slack.com. Thanks also to Magnify Money for supporting Stacky Benjamins, as we do fairly often. Let's head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And when we go there, it's funny. We've had a lot of people while I'm pulling this up. Uh, and it's funny because I actually get the best uh, savings accounts. Hopefully I can do two things at once here. And I don't think I can. So I just pulled this up. But before we get to that, a lot of questions this week in our basement Facebook group, stackybenjamins.com forward slash basement if you want to join us. A lot of questions about student loans and about where to refinance your student loans. And of course, if you head to Magnify Money, you'll notice one of the many things they look at is student loan refinance. And this week, actually, let's uh, let's pull up those different places, places like SoFi, Earnest, and Common Bond come in very, very 
tight together, all have very transparent paperwork. Looks like the interest rate about the same. The repayment terms are about the same. Lend Key, very close as well. Education Loan Finance, very close. Laurel Road, Bright Peak, not that far behind. So for student loan refinances, balance transfers, cashback rewards, savings accounts, checking accounts, it's all there. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. The average person who goes there saves 450 bucks. Welcome back, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Before we get to the trivia, I got a question that I need you to answer for me. Uh, when do you know if you're getting an inheritance? And is it okay to request one from a friend ahead of time? I'll figure it out later because I'm sure right now you're hanging on the edge of your seat waiting for your trivia answer. Here was the question. What is the median inheritance size left behind for beneficiaries? And the answer? According to the Survey of Consumer Finances, while the average was much bigger, some people give huge inheritances, just take note of that, the median size of an inheritance clocks in at $69,000. 69 G's! I'm definitely going to start writing some letters, seeing if someone wants to leave some of that money for moi. See ya! Big thanks to Doug for coming down to the basement and not, uh, not neighbor Doug, but Mr. Goldstein. Estate, yeah, neighbor Doug is here all the time. No thanks to him. Estate planning and inheritances, big, big part of if planning. I me some of them. Either way, sudden money, you don't want to make a mistake. I'll take it. And giving, giving money, you want to also not make a mistake. Hey, speaking of not making mistakes, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and we're going to tackle some of life's most important questions our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, your own and the team, they've put what you value first. Oh, baby, it's sudden money. Fao Shao. That's <laughs> or your, it. Or your loved That's ones. That's what I value in, the most. Or your loved ones in your time. And maybe Which it's. Create sudden money <laughs> if you do a good job of getting them insured. You're talking about loved ones who are about to die? Is that your. <laughs> you should surround yourself with. 90 <laughs> year old loved ones? Yes. Take all of your money. I mean, there are people who do that. You're you know, a horrible, I don't think that's a good idea. You're a horrible human being. Uh, your loved ones and your time, it's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. And they've made it totally simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. I love hearing what people say when they go for the free quote and they can't believe how quick it went. You see Kurt in the basement bragging about getting his Haven Life policy and how, yeah, Joe and OG say it's quick. It actually was quick. Like, it was. They weren't full of crap after all. Like what the hell do you Only think we're partially t- full of crap. That's like the new <laughs> t-shirt slogan. Yeah, we should have Brad make those t-shirts up. Uh, Joe and OG, only partially full of crap. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. I bet that'll be our best seller right there. Okay. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. A couple things about Haven Life. All policies are issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual. More than a 160-year-old insurer, and you don't have to wait several weeks for a decision. Most of the time, you're going to get one right now, and they have really lovely customer support. And lovely is probably my favorite word to uh, describe their customer support. But today, we're going to be lovely and help Danny with his issue. Say hi, Danny. Hi, Joe and OG. My name is Danny, and I invest only in stocks that have dividends. I'm having a hard time finding a website or a resource where that tells me their dividend growth history that goes back, you know, 15, 20 years. Would you have anything to, to recommend? Ben, thanks, Danny, for the question. Um, I have some bad news for Danny on my end, but how about you, man? <laughs> I'm guessing your bad news is nope. Well, I used to. I used to back when there were a few other uh, sites that have that are since bye bye. I used to use some sites; they all went belly up. So I used to excite.com was like yahoo.com, but they had a very robust year by year dividend paying, and but not just that, just year by year for the last 10, 15 years they would go back. Also, Clear Station I used to use that went belly up. That was another one that also did technical analysis. So the long answer was what I just gave you. The quick answer is I got nothing. How about you, OG? 
A uh, couple of ideas here that I would use if I was searching for it. First, your brokerage company, wherever you're buying these stocks at, Fidelity, Schwab, TD, probably has a stock screener that you can create like your own custom filter and say, you know, I'm looking for large company stocks with this uh, dividend payout, with this amount of dividend growth rate over this period of time. That's a good idea. I know idea. the premium version of Morningstar would have that also yeah. uh, if you felt like paying for it. Something else that I, I'm not going to look, but you can look for me, Danny, and let me know. How about uh, don't quit your day job? They have tons of charts and graphs and tons of market history on their site. What is that? D-Q-Y-D-J, right? Dot, dot net. net. Yep. And then Yahoo Finance still does have a pretty robust but not that robust uh, stock not, screener. Not 10, 15 years. Gonna have, I don't think I don't think it's gonna have that. But um I mean you're looking for either pretty close to professional research type stuff. You know, you can buy the subscription to Morningstar. It'll and that's have the th- that. and this is the thing. If you're using a service like Robinhood and you call them up and say, Hey, can you get me the this data? They're gonna laugh at you. But this is where if you're using a full service broker like a Merrill Lynch, where you're overpaying for every trade, you can call them up and say, hey, I want to see the 15-year stuff, and and, and they very well might send it to you. I really also feel like a Schwab or Fidelity or TD on their brokerage platform is going to have some pretty robust screening. It might not give you the history, but you might be able to say, I only want to search dividends that have increased 5% every year for the last 10 years. Right. And then it might give you the list of like, well, here's the 10 stocks that did that or whatever your criteria is. So you might not see the year by year, but you might get a screen with only the stocks that match the criteria. That match the criteria. I mean, and frankly, the other way to do it is, you know, look it up. Like go into the reports every year and pull down the the 10 Ks and... Well, 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 that's what I was thinking too. I use uh, bigcharts.com a fair amount. And the cool thing I like about big charts is that they have historical quotes but I'm not sure. Let me put in something on big charts right now using historical quotes. Uh, let's just, I don't know. I'm going to put in MO. Yep. Good idea. I know. So search symbol MO and let's go the date uh, 2000. He wants uh, 15 years ago. So 2003. And I know it'll give me the price on that day. Uh, but will it give me more information than that? Not seeing it. But for somebody who just wants to know historical prices on different days, using bigcharts.com is uh, is really helpful, especially if, oh, gee, you've got like stock splits and you want to go back yeah. and back and try to try to get that yeah, real information, get that information. Yeah. Big charts is a great place with their historical quotes piece. Uh, but looking at looking at the rest of this, see if I can get. Yeah, can't get uh, more information there. Uh, Pretty much, I think you're going to be limited to either, like you said, a full service broker or a robust investing platform that might be able to screen it for you, or a professional subscription to, you know, Thomson Reuters or uh, Morningstar or something like that. This is the time when I should say, also though, Danny, we've got another weapon, which is uh, Mom's Old Bridge Club listens to this show. So if any member of the Bridge Club knows if there's a place that they use, uh, aka the three people that listen to the show. If they know, if any of them know a place, this is when the fact that there's a little Stacky Benjamins community out there, uh, let us know. Joe at StackyBenjamins.com if there's a place you know that goes yeah, back that Yeah, put far. it in the basement. Yeah, you know. yep, the basement Facebook group. All right, uh, thanks for the question, Danny. And we also get letters down here in the basement. Doug just brought down the mail, and we've got a letter here from Loretta. Loretta says, hi, Joe and OG. I've been listening to your show for the past several months now. I might have learned something during that time but I can't say for sure. Well, today she learned Spanish, so that's good. Here's a question for you. I work for a small company that offers an employer-funded SEP IRA. For 2017, they contributed 15% of my salary, and I'm hoping to get at least that percentage in 2018, but it could be less, and I doubt it'll be more than $12,000 total. I currently have a side gig for extra income and wondering if you have some advice on any tax sheltered accounts where I could possibly put that additional money away. I already max out my Roth IRA and my HSA. Would a solo 401k make sense if I bring in less than $18,500 per year through the side gig? And can I contribute to that while also having an employer funded SEP IRA? Thanks for the help. Great question, Loretta. So if, if she's already got a retirement plan provided by an employer, can she set up another one for her side gig? 
Sure, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, you can make it as complicated as doing a solo 401k, or you could just open another SEP. So you could have another SEP that allows you to contribute up to 25% of your income from your side business into that. If you did the solo 401k, that might give you a little bit more contribution amount, you know, because you can do that full 18.5. But your total contributions will start coming into play here, depending on how much money you make in your full time gig, which can't be more than uh, 55 or 54 and a half thousand or something like that. But um, it's usually best, especially when you're layering on these extra plans where you've got that side business or whatever the case may be. Work with your CPA at the end of the year because you have until your tax filing deadline to make those contributions. And I think it's a bigger pain in the butt to try to pull those contributions out in the subsequent year if you put in too much throughout the year. So I would really recommend at this point that uh, whether you use a SEP or a a solo 401k to just work with your CPA as you're doing your taxes and say, okay, I got these three different jobs or I got these two different jobs. Here's what's going here. Here's what's going here. How much more can I put away? There's a really simple uh, button that all tax preparers, we just click it. We just like, it's the easy button. You can put in X dollars, you know, and and the computer does it for you. It just goes, boom, that's it. And frankly, if you're not using a CPA, TurboTax will do it for you too. So, or whatever tax preparing software, just just don't be doing this by hand is what I'm saying. But then you have the flexibility because again, if you put in 10,000 and then you find out, oh crap, I could only put in 9,200. You've got to do calculations on earnings. You've got to do calculations on the withdrawal amount. You've got to send that into your custodian. Then you're going to issue a 1099 next year. I know there's some uh, retirement plans you got to set up by the end of the year, even though you can make contributions through filing time. Does she have a December 31st deadline on either of these or maybe even earlier? Absolutely. Simple IRAs, which that didn't come up in the conversation. Those need to be in place by October. Uh, So you've got uh, 11 days to knock that out. But SEPs, you can open the account. You don't have to fund it. And uh, same thing with the solo 401ks. Although your contributions for the solo 401k need to be in. So so the difference between a SEP and a solo 401k is that the SEP is funded entirely from the employer. If you're self-employed, you kind of feel like it's your money anyway, but you got to kind of think about it like employer revenue versus earnings. But the solo 401k, your contributions as an employee have to be in before calendar year end. As an employer, the matching, whatever you decide to do there, you have until uh, the tax filing deadline for your business. It's cool that she's got uh, an employer who puts 15% of her salary into a SEP. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. We should talk to payroll and see if we can get that deal here. Yeah, maybe give it to Doug. Then we have to pay him eight bucks. So I don't know. How do we want to give anything to Doug? Well, because he's an employee. Oh, how do we do this stuff where we only benefit? Oh, yeah. We got a powwow there. Well, we want to include Richie and Caden, but uh, but not Doug. Is there a way we can just exclude Doug? Have we paid him anything ever? I mean, we just keep on telling him this thing doesn't make any money. So We'll, we'll just give him the 15% of what he makes now. Congratulations. Yeah. You're Congratulations. Good, good, good point. You got, a, you, got a, you got a 200% pay raise this year. Good point. We're good. We're fine. Thanks for the question, Loretta. If, if you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com and at the top of the page, you'll see questions for the show. Click that link and you'll see all the ways to interface with us. Uh, the only difference today between Loretta and Danny is that Danny's taking home one of those awesome, 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 awesome Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirts. And by the way, some of these we have now turned into mugs. Check out uh, the From the Basement mug here. This is the 1950s movie show T-shirt, which is uh, pretty funny. Talks about that lovable scamp OG. That's that's that I think is my favorite I, part of Brad's design. That lovable scamp I, OG. I totally want to have you send me a couple of these. But we recently bought new flatware for the kitchen or whatever for the house, and it comes with like 24 coffee cups. Did it and really? I'm, to, I'm like, we need four at max, you know, or maybe six if i mean what? <laughs> so we have all these coffee mugs in our i mean it's ridiculous i have no place to put them i like coffee mugs from the places i go like when i do the money in I the morning too. show i i always love like i've got this uh this coffee mug here brewed in kansas city that from uh boulevard brewery from kansas city got it so yeah good stuff uh when we were in uh, Bavaria, we should probably eat the barbecue that you left in there though 
Did I? A good point. Did I tell you that I went to Bavaria when we went oh, there? Yeah. No, it's a new thing. We went there. We went. We visited a salt mine, and I've got this cool Bavarian salt mine mug. Yeah, fantastic. Just to prove I was oh. there, because you can't get it online. You got to go there. Right. Yeah. Okay. We got to ride the slide in the salt mines. They used to send the salt down. That was pretty neat. Mm. Got to ride okay. a tra- ride a train. Fifty year old man, so excited about riding a train through the salt mine. Did you go kachiga, kachiga, kachiga the, the whole time? The whole flipping way. The, the entire way. Mm-hmm. It was Did amazing. you say, can I blow the horn? Everybody's wondering when the heck we're done with this. We're done with it as soon as I say this. OG's firm is taking on new clients. And if you are looking to do better with your financial planning, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G. That's going to do it for today for us. Thanks again to Doug Goldstein. Well, you know what? Doug's going to take care of all that. Doug, back to you, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, estate plans? Heck, if the Grim Reaper sent you an engraved invitation and he's showing up with a limousine, finish your estate plan the day before. But if not, take Doug Goldstein's advice and put your plans in writing today. Second, receiving an inheritance? Remember that doing nothing is a viable alternative for the short run. Better not to make any rash or emotional decisions. But the big lesson? Don't ask Joe's mom if you can have 69 grand when she dies. Ever. Trust me. Special thanks to Doug Goldstein for stopping by the basement. You'll find Doug's book at profile-financial.com along with other resources such as his hit podcast, Goldstein on Gelt. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes. Not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. The people responsible for this show have been sacked. I don't think we have time to talk about the entire history of OG because th- we're going to save that for the Wikipedia page. When I should have my own Wikipedia page. I don't know why you don't. You really should. It's a long storied history. Your f- mom's been on the show. People are asking, by the way, in my Money in the Morning recording session today, people were asking when your mom's coming back on the show. So tell her oh, that. Oh, God, really? T- tell her. Nobody she- said that for sure. Did no, they? no. Our friend Amika in C- Cincinnati. Said, I'm wondering, okay. wondering when OG's mom's coming on the show. So okay, I'll let her know. Yeah, so she's a star. Yes, she, she has to learn how to. She's totally. The, <laughs> I love you, mom, but she's totally like the person because we're sitting across the table from one another. But we'd have to do the short wave with mom. She'd be totally the person that would be like staring into the microphone on the short wave, going, "I can't see anybody. Am I supposed to see this? <laughs> you know, or whatever." <laughs> Mom, we got, the new sh- on? we got the new shortwave with video. Look up here. Yeah, it would be totally that old person using technology meme of like you just see like their eyebrows and above. Right. Wouldn't you see know, any the of their face. 
right. It's almost like having a bag on your head. Like, oh, what? That's where I learned it from. So we don't have time for all of the OG lore, but we will say this, is that when we first started the show, we thought it would be funny to give OG a nickname. And initially, initially we said, okay, so what are we going to call you? And we'll be like, Joe and, I don't know, the other guy. And then we realized the other guy was OG, which is also original gangsta. And it's one of yeah. our many little inside jokes on the show um, that, yep. <laughs> that is, we'll talk about the paper bag some other day, because uh, there's a background on that too. But that's a, that's a whole, whole, whole different reason why OG wears a bag over his head, besides the fact that he's a face for radio. But You'll see. Yeah. Come to the live event. Come, maybe. Maybe. I thought you were wearing the bag at the live event. Oh, yeah, shoot. Yeah. Well, maybe. I have to. You're right. It's... Yes. So... I can't get through TSA security very well. It's... <laughs> they are not <laughs> pleased. Oh, oh, we're watching a movie. Got it. Move along. Move <laughs> along. Good story. Good story, OG. Do you Email like us the rest of it. <laughs> The music's playing. Da, 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 da. Here comes the hook. I can't believe I did. I might as well have hit the gong at that I'm point. I'm guessing you saw a movie on your airplane, so do tell. I did, and it was a movie that uh, came out in Britain in 2017, but came out here in 2018. It's a World War One movie called Journey's End. Every little noise up there makes me feel sick. I suppose you are knocked out. You won't have to bear this hell anymore. Second Lieutenant Rally, sir. What is it you're after? An old friend is out here, Captain Stannon. You don't want to join them. They may have a hell of a time of it. That's just what I'm hoping for, sir. You haven't been in the army five minutes, have you? Our company commander, you know? Hello, Stannon. You will find him changed. He's led this company through all sorts of rotten times. Big strain on a man. He used to come and stay with me and my sister Margaret in the holidays. She is beautiful. Is she waiting for you? I don't want her to see how shot I am. We won't last five minutes if the Germans attack. You'll just stay where you are for as long as you can. When's it expected? Day after tomorrow. German attack coming the day after tomorrow. They have better and better and better information that says it is coming the day after tomorrow. And everything confirms that it's coming then. And so the movie is largely based on Charlie Company waiting in a trench in World War I, of course, which was all trench warfare, and uh, waiting in this horrible trench, knowing from the time that they go out uh, to the front line that they're going to be the very place it is 95% sure that they're going to be the very place that the Germans decide to attack when they bring it. All night long, they can hear trains because these trenches are not very far away from each other. So the Germans mm -hmm. just keep bringing more and more and more people in by train. Uh, the movie features uh, one actor. These are, these are all actors that you've seen before, but are not. If I told you all their names, you'd probably go, oh, yeah, uh -huh, that guy. But one actor plays, as you heard in the piece, uh, the new lieutenant who went to school with the with the Charlie Company commander. By the way, Charlie Company was a real company. This is follows real events that actually happened in World War I. And he went to school with the guy, so he requests to go into that company. And even knowing one of the generals there requests, and you hear, you heard earlier a guy tell him, you don't want to go with Charlie Company because they're about to get it pretty bad. And he said, no, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Well, uh, that's that's where the story starts, and I won't go into exactly what happens because that's what the movie's about. But this isn't just a, a war movie. It's also a movie about the people in the trenches. And if you are at all somebody who watches historical war films, this, I think, would be a must-see. It's a very good movie, especially about World War I and just about how, how frustratingly futile that war was when you have technology now going you've you now have technology og that doesn't really support trench warfare they have guns that are phenomenal they have technology that's getting better all the time and yet they're still fighting the war as if it's yeah as if it's 1750 an, yeah it's an earlier time and so just the just the loss of life that happens for pretty much no reason 
incredibly frustrating. But also as a as somebody that really likes digging back into history, I thought it was a great movie. I obviously can't say I enjoyed it, right? You don't get done and go, man, that was fun. There is not much fun about this movie. So if you're waiting for a fun movie, this ain't the one. But if you're looking for a glimpse into trench warfare in World War I, big thumb up. Cool. All right. It's on the list. This actually does sound like a movie that you would see. Yeah. Probably. Once. Yeah. I see most of those movies one time. Yeah. But it does seem like your kind of movie. Like there's times when you say, okay, great. Sounds good. I'm like, yeah, he's never seen that. This one actually seems like a movie that you would see and... um and is, is your kind of movie. Well, I'm going to be on, what do we say, eight airplanes between now and the end of the year. So I have lots of American Air screen time ahead of me. Lots of So time. up your game, American Air, if you're listening, because I've seen everything already that's on there. Journey's End. Is, that's the only movie I watched coming or going to Europe. The rest of the time was just filled with bourbon. On the way there, I played uh, Civilization on my computer and slept and read. And on the way back, I read Nerd. I read, and I watched uh, a few episodes of Modern Family, which I don't watch. Cheryl, Cheryl's watched it. Oh, really? It, yeah, that's a nice light show to have on. That's It's perfect for the airplane. I'm laughing my head off. It is so yeah. funny. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. Yes. Just laugh, laugh, laugh. Philosophies. <laughs> just so well written. And they were playing from season one. Uh, which, oh, yeah. Which, real old stuff, yeah, which, which is, is really funny, too. Yeah, because the few episodes I've seen, you know, the characters are already ingrained. So here they're kind of introducing the characters, which is hilarious. So, yeah, very, very funny. So, uh, that yeah, that, this is the only film I dug into and uh, really liked it. 